welcome to another episode of Whiskeys for Drinking, Waters for Fighting. And today, guess what? We're going to be talking about water, about a kind of a different kind of water. We're going to be talking about the process of fracking. We got a group here for the conversation. Let's just jump in real quick. Tell us who, tell us who we got around the table today. Hey, Jeff. Darren Smith here, Chief Technology Officer for Encore Green Environmental. Hey, Jeff, uh, John Robitaille, uh, CEO Encore Green Environmental uh, here in Casper, Wyoming. Hi, I'm Marvin Nash. I'm the uh, Senior Advisor for Encore Green and, and help with the Synergy for Ecological Solutions. And I'm here in uh, the capital of the wonderful state of Wyoming, Cheyenne today. Neil Farringer, I'm the Director of Agronomy for the organization. I'm in my Billings bunker. <laughs> Very good. All right. And I'm Jeff Holder, and I'm the director of Synergy for Ecological Solutions, the nonprofit looking to bring climate wellness through soil health. So we're going to talk about fracking, but I think maybe the first step we ought to do is just, uh, hey, Darren, tell us what fracking is. I think, I think in order to explain fracking, uh, I, think it's, I think it's important to kind of describe the history of production in, in the United States or in North America. And the, re and the reason why fracking was created is that, you know, back in the 20s and the early uh, days of the oil production in the United States, oil was really extracted from what are called shallow geological pools. And uh, we all know that oil is kind of lighter than water and it tends to float uh, up. And, and these early, these, this early production really uh, uh, exploited these pools where it was just simply uh, you could drill a well and it's kind of like a straw and you could just drop it right into the oil reservoir and extract it but you know all that all that uh, pool production has pretty much been exhausted in the United States and, and, and elsewhere in North, in North America which forces uh, production into what's known as source rock and it's really the rock that is the it is it is just like it says it's it's it is the source of hydrocarbons and it's actually the source that provided the oil into those pools as, uh, as it migrated up through the geology. So there's a lot of, there's an extremely, uh, there's an extreme amount of uh, hydrocarbons still locked in the source rock. The only problem is the source rock is very tight rock. And it's not enough just to drill a well into the source rock and expect the hydrocarbon to flow to the well in any economic uh, rates. And, and by economic, I mean, uh, oil production or gas production needs to come to the well bore in a rate that really pays for itself. And if it's, uh, and if it's below that, then uh, it doesn't make any sense to drill wells. So, so the oil and gas industry developed a technology known as hydraulic fracturing. Uh, it's, what it essentially does is it's a, it's a controlled manner, whereas uh, high pressure uh, fluids are uh, introduced to the well bore and uh, it initiates fractures in the uh, source rock in these zones that uh, contain hydrocarbon. And with those fluids uh, is carried what's called propant or frac sand. And essentially what happens is these uh, fractures are propagated, the frac sand is introduced into the fractures and it props the rock open. And, uh, the, and, essentially, and essentially what this means is that when, you, when, a, when a well's been hydraulically fractured, the permeability of the rock is increased such that now there's enough there's enough production coming to the well bore to make the well now economic. So it's a way to overcome the uh, uh, the low porosity and permeability of of these tight rocks that uh, that that really is the source of uh, oil and gas production in North America now. So it's a way to just optimize, be more efficient, and find kind of undiscovered oil, basically, just another way to keep it going. Correct. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. And and uh, like I said, you know, there's there's also, just while we're on this topic, there's there's also a tremendous amount of geology that contains hydrocarbon, but it it is so immature in its in its life that there's there's really just not enough pressure in that rock to even drive any hydrocarbon to the well bore, and and so I think I think we'll be hearing about a new technology sometime that's going to be uh, introduced to allow us to produce hydrocarbon from what's known as these under pressure reservoirs, this, this real young hydrocarbon that really hasn't been in the ground long enough to even generate enough pressure to allow it to flow at all to the well bore. Great. And what's been the, what, what's the positive that's come out of, out of this new pro of this kind of new, new improved process of, of getting oil out of the ground? Well, Jeff, like I said, 
uh, since the since the early production and the in the, the typical uh, hydrocarbon pools were exploited and exhausted, it, it really it really represents what what oil and gas is uh, in North America today. And and we all know that uh, the amount of production from hydraulic fracturing from the source rock is uh, is enough for us to become independent from sources uh, of oil in the world from places for instance that aren't our uh, that aren't our friends like Iran and, uh, and places in the Middle East so we can be self-sufficient and energy sufficient uh, because of hydraulic fracture. And one of the things that and this is kind of starts getting into how water enters into the, the conversation about fracking and then John maybe explain about the water coming out of the oil well because we think of oil well well oil comes out, right? But tell us about the, the process of fracking that also gives us uh, a lot of water. You know, Jeff, uh, when we start with a frack, it, it's a uh, it's type of a gel. It's not quite like jello, but imagine imagine a jello with with sand floating in the jello itself. I've been to those potlucks. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, potluck on the beach, right? So right. So the, the, this gel is then, is then injected into the formation with, this, with the sand intermixed in the gel. Uh, now, now keep in mind that, that, that these processes are so extremely highly technically engineered that they can, they can tell you exactly where this frack is going to go, how high it's going to go, how deep it's going to go. Uh, oftentimes, if you're if you're sitting in a room that's uh, that's got an eight foot ceiling, your frack is not going to go above or below the eight feet of that ceiling. Like you, you would run your wellbore directly through the room, and your frack is not going to go above or below that. Now the the thing is, we we start with a gel, we inject it under a, a tremendous amount of pressure. Now that gel then sits in the in the formation. And we want it in, in the gel form so that sand can get into those cracks and actually hold that, that crack open. It's called propant uh, for a reason, right? It's, uh, we use a, a particular type of sand, but, but uh, because it's called propant, it's, it's actually moved into those cracks and it holds those cracks open because you can imagine that they're under pressure. So if you have a tight crack, you, you open it with pressure you release the pressure, it closes again. By opening that pressure, putting something in it, that crack doesn't shut. And because of that, we're allowed to get the, the uh, hydrocarbon out, whether it be natural gas or oil. Once that gel has set for a little, little bit, it will start to liquid. It, it, it turns into a liquid. And, and because there is a tremendous amount of water used in, in fracking, uh, it's, it's really 99.9% of, of the mixture that goes into a frack. Once that's in, we pull it out. You, you pump it out. And you pump it out so that the, the hydrocarbon can actually move to the well bore. Otherwise, it's, it's under pressure constantly. So as you pull it out, you're pulling out uh, the pieces of sand that, that did not go into a, a crack. Uh, you're pulling out the, uh, the the few chemicals that are that are included in the frack, uh, but you're also pulling out a lot of the water, and then that is uh, that is reused and uh, cleaned up. Uh, any hydrocarbon that may be in there is separated from it, uh, and so on. Once that well is in production, as Darren said, uh, you know, when we if we look at a typical formation, uh, you know, it's it's certainly not this simple, but but you could you can you can think of natural gas on top, right beneath that would be oil, right beneath that would be water. Typically, you know, of course, uh, gas is, is lighter, oil is lighter. On an on a oil well, when you're producing the oil, sometimes a gas well, uh, you're gonna be producing water as well at some point. Uh, it's just part of the formation. And, and that's, the, that's the thing that, uh, that we're after. Uh, we are after repurposing that water. We want to use it for beneficial uses. 
Yeah, and it, and it seems like that it would be a no-brainer, but right now, what's typically, what's the status quo? Marvin, tell us, what, what's the status quo of this water? So as I understand, it, you know, a barrel of, of oil comes out, right? And a barrel is 42 gallons. So for every one barrel of oil, we can get three to six barrels of water. And then you kind of do the math and these wells are producing a thousand barrels a day or more, you know, we'll just, be, we're talking about a huge amount of water coming out. What is typically done with that water right now on, on, under status quo? Well, uh, you know, that's a, that's a really, really good question, Jeff. And, and, and I don't know that there is a status quo. I, I think that's why whiskey's for drinking and water's for fighting because because we don't know what the status quo is and the status quo is changing uh, almost daily. I mean, you know, we, we're constantly bombarded with uh, ads about another, what they call midstream, which is the people that, that uh, oil and gas companies, producers, a lot of times they just want the water to go away. So they contract with a midstream company. So the status quo is for, for us, for me personally, is to identify a way to put this water to beneficial use. Uh, a lot of people call it, call it uh, produced water, which I think the engineers probably identified it as produced because it came up with the well. I, I looked at it entirely different and I said, time out, you know, you didn't get a permit, oil and gas company, to drill a water well. You got a permit to drill an oil and gas well and therefore the water is a byproduct so the status quo in why in status quo in wyoming because of, of statutes you know 41-3904 that water is actually called byproduct it's not called i mean it's produced but it can turn to a byproduct which can be put to beneficial use our, our texas ranchers and farmers and mou guys you know that we have relationships with down there all the surface landowners supposedly own the water under the ground so the the status quo is is changing or is is being determined almost daily and and it, it's a very very exciting agenda but it, it's almost like the wild west i mean it's like whoever gets control of it is going to have this product water and uh you know i i've become a fan of this old movie that has burt lancaster and audrey hepburn in it and, and burt lancaster does this little monologue about water's water it's it's for drinking it's for kids to play and it's for to make mud mud puddles out of you know it, it's all of these things but at the end of the day water's water and water is the source of survival i'm not saying we found a new source of water with byproduct water but i'm saying we may have stumbled onto a new way that technology allows us to take what some people consider a waste and turn it into a byproduct and put it to beneficial use when the engineers started developing fracking in 70s or so i think it was they went to congress and they went to the legislature they went to dc and they said hey we're going to have this water we got to do something with it so Senator Lloyd Benson and a senator from Louisiana, they got the EPA to identify it as a hazmat with an exemption, which meant they could put it into a disposal well down in the ground and stuff. Uh, there's a, an article in the Huffington Post or, or uh, Washington Post, one of them, it, it's called the 70 million barrel loophole. And what it was, it was just the, the, the dichotomy of how energy companies can handle water. What we're saying now is, wait a minute, there's a new different way to do this. We need the oil, no question about it. If you're totally opposed to fossil fuel, understand that. But think about your synthetic stretch pants that you wear or the plastic cup that you drink out of or any of these other things that have uh, oil and gas components in them in, in their makeup. So there's no way we could just walk out of the room, turn the light off and say, we're going to stop fossil fuel. That's not going to happen. We can improve the amount we use. We can do a lot of these things that, that are politically 
uh, hot potatoes that we talk about. But at the end of the day, that water is going to continue to be there. The best thing that I think we can do is figure out how to put that water to beneficial use. You know, and, and I'll refer to probably to Neil at this point, because Neil can tell us about what that water can do to our stewardship and, and our, our land management and our soil health and our carbon capture. And I mean, it just goes on and on and on and on. But the key was, how do you make that transition of wasting the water or putting it to uh, through a disposal and making it beneficial? The, the, that's, a, that's a good, that's a funny way of saying the status quo, you know, and, and, and you're going to, you know, I'm going to identify you as the, as the LA guy that wants to know what's the status quo, you know, what the, the status quo really could almost depend on state to state, county to county, uh, company to company on how we approach the repurposing of water. Right. And, but I think uh, like a number of years ago, Marvin, you, you were beating the door down trying to get people to kind of focus on it because there was kind of a sense of, hey, we, we, we're good to just throw this water away, basically. Just put it down a well, let it evaporate, you know, but you've been really the instigator of, of a change to make the status quo right now kind of be a little up in the air, like you were saying, because everybody's vying for this, because essentially it does kind of mean that we have a new source of water at, at some level. And, and the people who have, who have wells on their property that is producing all this water, also on that exact same acreage, they're, they're desperate for water because they live in the, the arid west. And so this is just simply a, uh, it's really like a no brainer idea but it has been a, a, a long road, I know, for you to get to people to the point where they'll say, well, yeah, now let's start doing it. And it's sort of like taking off like wildfire now. Now, this, now the conversation is very much about what are we going to do with this water? How are we going to repurpose it? What is the value of water? Who gets to own it? Who, all those questions. When just a few years ago, nobody was asking those questions. So it, it's really been a process. But but like we said, you know, the people where the this these oil wells sit on people's property, you know, a lot of times it's not just sort of like, oh, there's this land over here and that's just for oil, you know. A lot of times the people are the landowners have oil wells on their land, especially in the West, ranchers, farmers, that kind of thing. And so talk to us, Neil, uh, a little bit about about water. You know, if if one of the end games is okay, this fracking, and that's good, and it does all these good things in, in, in terms of, of oil production and, and this kind of thing. What is it that this water can now be repurposed? What, what, what does this represent for someone who is trying to ranch or to farm um, on, on land in the West? Well, thank, <clears throat> thanks, Jeff. Um, yes, the, the, the water is essential. So um, for instance, in, uh, if we're trying to produce alfalfa, it takes four and a quarter inches per acre to raise a ton of hay. And the plants all have different water usage rates. Grass is much more efficient, to, uh, say the range grass, than say alfalfa is. It's a pretty high water user. Uh, corn and sugar beets use a lot of water, but we can add some water on dry years, like uh, Wyoming had last year um, an extreme drought. Uh, we could put on six inches of water and that would return us back to normal where we'd have the normal grass production, which then would allow the, the ranchers not to have to sell their cows or buy expensive hay. When there's droughts in this country, then uh, the dryland hay never produces as well. And then the farmers have to, or the ranchers have to buy expensive hay instead of being maybe being $100, $120 a ton and all of a sudden it's $200, $250 a ton plus trucking. So it is a real way to um, enhance their operations so they don't go backwards. Nobody likes going backwards in their operation. You know, to say, to kind of, I like to quantify things in, again, I know we've done, I've done this in a previous podcast, but in the state of Wyoming in 2019, there was 1.7 billion barrels of oil water that was produced, and uh, that's 71 billion gallons. Well, based on our history with two different techniques of processing the water, we have a 70% cleaning rate that met drinking water standards in the state of Wyoming that was set by Wyoming DEQ. Well, that 
would re result in 165,000 acre feet of water. If we put six inches on, that's 330,000 acres that we could irrigate every year with the Wyoming water. And then, then we look at Colorado, Oklahoma, Texas. So we could be doing a lot then for increasing or maintaining grass production. Um, when the grass doesn't have enough water, then we lose our root structure as well. It goes backwards, it just doesn't grow. And so with the increase in carbon in our atmosphere, more plant production or consistent plant production from year to year would increase the carbon capture out of the, the atmosphere and put it into the soil and maintain it there. There's always leakage out of the soil from carbon back up to the atmosphere, but we could have a net increase of carbon capture. So essentially you're saying, hey, the land needs water, right? You're staying the obvious, but you've quantified it. And that's really what a lot of the, the fracking opportunities are, is that this water can be repurposed and, and put to beneficial use as, as Marvin was outlining it. So, so John, I know this hasn't gone without regulation. This hasn't, uh, there's a political component to this as suddenly nobody was bothering to think about it. And then in the last year, 18 months, Marvin and Encore Green's traction has been such that it's making people go, well, wait a minute, maybe we need to be paying some attention to it. Where is the just a 10,000 foot regulatory snapshot? I think it's all state by state. There's regulatory agencies and that kind of thing. Tell us just kind of where we stand right now with this produced water, this byproduct water that comes from the fracking wells from a political regulatory state. Where are we right now? You know, Jeff, uh, right now, many states, uh, each state regulates differently. They're all similar in ways, but uh, we'll, just, we'll just take Wyoming because that's where I'm sitting. The, the, the Wyoming Department of Environmental Quality and the Wyoming Oil and Gas Conservation Commission both regulate how produced water, or byproduct water is, uh, is managed. So uh, in order to, to, uh, to get a permit for, uh, let's say, an evaporation pond, you, you have to go through the Wyoming DEQ. Uh, you have to get bonding. Uh, and you, you, uh, you have to go through a, a number of things, which then that permit that DEQ issues also goes to uh, the Region 8 EPA in Denver. And uh, EPA has to sign off on it as well. Now, with, with a disposal well, depending on the type of disposal well, you may have to go to the Wyoming Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, get permission and a permit, or you may have to go through the Wyoming Department of Environmental Quality. Uh, either one of these, again, has to go through uh, the EPA and get EPA to sign off on them. Uh, what we're hoping to see is more use of Encore Green's permitting. Uh, we actually have permits in hand in Wyoming that allow us to repurpose this byproduct water and actually apply it on the land for agricultural purposes. Uh, we have permits through the Wyoming Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. We have permits through the Wyoming Department of Environmental Quality. And in, in the instance where we need it, we permit through the Wyoming State Engineer's Office in order to appropriate that water for the, the beneficial use. So we're, we're, we're starting to see this trend of people actually seeing the benefit of using this water rather than uh, simply disposing of it in some manner. So in order to continue this trend, uh, we're working on other states and other permitting issues, hoping to uh, be allowed to, to actually repurpose this water for beneficial use in other states as well. So we're working on it. We're hoping that, uh, that this trend continues so that we can actually put this water to use. Yeah, and so John or, or Marvin, what, who, what are all the other companies that have permits to take this water, treat it, clean it, make sure it's going to be applicable to the soil and then land apply it? Who, who else has the permits in the United States to do that? 
Well, I, uh, you know, great question. I don't think we've be begun to see the fight that's going to come about in the years to come. I think the lawyers are going to get involved. I think the landowners are going to get involved. I think the, the environmental, everybody's going to try to be a stakeholder in this water. Currently, I don't know of anybody that has a permit to ground apply water. There, there are some of them that have a permit to uh, mix the water, blend it with a WIPSES or a NIPSES permit. Uh, Darren and John can probably scientifically talk about that or Neil a little bit in greater detail if we need to. But, but that is a solution to pollution is dilution. We have been able to find technology that has a proven track record uh, because some of the uses in the energy industry and you, you got to be real clear, there's a difference between repurposing and putting to beneficial use. If you bring your frack water up out of the ground, you knock the, what I call knock the bolts and the sticks and the, the grunge out of it, and you re, reuse it to frack, which technology on the fracking side now allows us to do, that's repurposing. But that's not putting it to quote unquote beneficial use where it goes to ground application to, to bring about healthy soil, uh, increased root growth, all, all of those kind of different things. But, but currently, I don't know of anyone that has a permit from an environmental agency to ground apply water. If you're listening to this and you do know, please let us know because we'd like to, you know, we'd like to, to see how, what, what it is and how it works because at the end of the day, we, we need to put this water to beneficial use. Right, and, and, and just to clarify, you say no one has it, but except for Encore Green Environmental and doing the work and trying yeah. to work in the different states. So does anyone else have, have thoughts on the, this topic, this topic of fracking, this topic of, of all this water production that is happening just every day, day after day after day after day after day, so many barrels, so many millions of gallons of water. I, any further thoughts on that? Yeah, Jeff, I've got some thoughts. You know, back in the uh, around 2014, there was a, there was a lot there was a lot of criticism about uh, hydraulic fracturing and the risk to drinking water, and and uh, there was study after study after study conducted uh, looking for uh, some nexus between hydraulic fracturing and drinking water uh, supply contamination, and, and really. Really, that, uh, that debate's over now. I mean, uh, like John was mentioning, hydraulic fracturing can be done uh, safely in a controlled manner. And the truth of the matter is, is that the oil and gas reservoirs are so greatly uh, distant from uh, drinking water aquifers that it's just not feasible. You can't generate enough. You can't, you, the reality is you can't generate enough force underground to propagate a fracture into to a drinking water aquifer just because of the geologic separation. So anyway, that debate's over. The other thing, the other thing that was really criticized about the industry was this. I think it was even called this toxic frac chemical cocktail or something uh, to that regard. And, and the truth of the matter is, is frac treatments are, are have become. The, the, it's it's true that because of the lateral well and the, the kind of the length of the wells has increased, so the water demand for hydraulic fracturing has increased. But the but the complexity of the frac, the complexity, uh, complexity of the chemical makeup of the frac treatments has really been reduced. It's uh, it's quite simple. You can find that information on uh, fracfocus.org. Every company is required now to uh, disclose the chemicals that they use. But you'll see that it's uh, it's actually quite boring. There's a, there's a gel. Uh, oftentimes that gel is made from guar, which is a natural polymer. It's uh, it's in a lot of our chewing gum, for instance. Uh, there's a there's a chemical con to control. Uh, uh, there's a chemical to control uh, biological activity, and uh, there's chemicals in there to reduce some friction. But uh, at the end of the day, they're all non-hazardous. They're and they're and from my perspective, they're uh, they're extremely easy to get out of water. Now we understand how to do that. We understand how to treat it. So uh, so we can remove them. And and because uh, because we're able to do that, that's why we're able to be issued permits to be able to put this on the ground. So there's nothing mysterious about hydraulic fracturing. It's safe and, uh, and it's not anything that anybody needs to worry about with regard to uh, repurposing this water. Yeah, uh, so um, this is Neil Farringer, the agronomist. And so uh, Darren just mentioned the guar um, that's in gum. It's uh, from the guar bean. So it is, it's a natural plant that is grown. 
um, in warmer climates that they like it's a thickening agent people on the keto diet use it to gar gum but as a thickening agent instead of uh, cornstarch so that's what it kind of is is the, probably the gel is more like a gravy isn't it uh john and darren right yeah I, i've been to that pot, pot that same potluck had the had the gravy like that too i think so. sand gravy yeah yep absolutely Yep. Hey, we appreciate you guys listening. We uh, ask you to subscribe to us, leave a review on whatever platform you're listening to this on. If you want to know a little bit more about some of the things that we talked about, here's a, here's a few links. One is frackfocus.org. That's what Darren just mentioned. If you want to read a little bit more about fracking, it's F-R-A-C-F-O-C-U-S. There's no K. Frackfocus.org. You can also check us out at... Uh, encoregreenenvironmental.com and at synergy for ecological solutions.org. We appreciate you tuning in and we'll keep fighting about water.